Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas, presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, Ken. How are you, your family, everybody? Uh, how's your healing going on with your post-surgery, uh, you know, rehab with your shoulder? Yep. Yep, everything's good. Bruising starting to go away now. You can see it kind of drifted from my shoulder down to my bicep. But yeah, it feels good. Two weeks out tomorrow. Um, yeah, everything's good. Kids are good. Everybody's doing good. Thank God. I've, I've got to be the luckiest guy in the world. Happy to be here with you. Every week is like a, a, a new gift, the, the gift that keeps on giving. We get to talk about combat sports every day, every week with the legend Teddy Atlas. Honestly, it's important sometimes for not just for me, for everyone in your life recognize the things that you're grateful for and uh, acknowledge them and let people know, hey, I'm super grateful and happy to have you in my life. And that applies here. So well, I'm imp- happy to I be appreciate here with you, as that. always. And I'm impressed to be able to be on with you and have you with me. And every week, look at you looking so fit, so fine, <laughs> and your hair always so perfectly uh, <laughs> manicured. And I, that alone... Uh, is, is <laughs> I can't even put a price on that to see somebody that well groomed with every hair in place. Uh, that's that's pretty damn impressive. And I found a new barber here in Nashville, oh, actually, wow. Teddy, a Kurdish guy from Kyrgyzstan, from uh, actually from Iraq. And the guy was really good. In the first couple of times, I thought this guy's really good, but he's rushing rushing through the job so today i said to him hey i'm, I'm uh, I, no joke i think it's 25 dollars for a haircut when i was in la you know it was probably 100 so i said to him today i said listen here's 70 dollars. you're excellent at cutting hair just take your time and do, and he's like take your time sit down he's like make yourself comfortable we got nothing but time now and my and uh his friend cut my my, my two younger sons hair and uh yeah, now I'm psyched. I've got a new guy. I don't have to fly my guy in from L.A. anymore. I've got a guy here in Nashville, and he's the best. Wow. <laughs> when you were saying Russian, I, I was thinking, what do you have against Russians? I mean, oh, oh, <laughs> come on. I mean, I've trained a whole bunch of them. You know, even fortunate enough to Russians. have a former heavyweight champ of the world. Uh, what, what do you, come on, what are you talking about? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, now you better be careful, though, with the deal. You gave him $70 and told him to yep. take his time. He, he'll be there for a yep. weekend with you. You watch. <laughs> because he had thinking, no, he had he thinking right his away, mind. He had thinking his mind. <laughs> of, 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 take, he likes me taking my time. I can take my time. That 70 <laughs> can easily become like 240. <laughs> watch watch yourself G- give me a report on that in a couple of weeks and let me know how I that's will. going i will i'm um, eventually what i would love to do is graduate to having him come to the house for a hundred bucks hey for a hundred will you drive over here and do it that will make my life real easy um but anyway did you uh i know you had a chance to watch that kel brook and uh amir khan fight and i i was texting you and rob say guys this first round these guys are going at it this looks like it might be a good match well the the aggressiveness didn't end, but the terms of the competitive good match didn't last very long. Kell Brook started taking over after the second and just, oh my goodness, one-way traffic all night after the second. And he just put it on Amir Khan. Amir Khan looked to be every day his whatever his age is, late to mid-30s. Same and, age uh, as Brook. You know, same uh, age as Brook. Brook's right up there yeah, with him. Yeah, yeah. But go ahead, continue. He just seemed, uh, Amir, uh, uh, my friend Jelly Roll was asking me before the fight, hey, what do you think here? I said, look, my my, my untrained analysis prior to the fight, I said, I think that Amir Khan's probably the better boxer, but he's so chinny, like he's going to get knocked out with a jab and literally on cue, he started getting rocked with every shot that uh, Brooke touched him with. Not to mention, you see the physique on Brooke? I don't know if they were like drug testing over there, but if they weren't, man, what a genetic freak! He, that guy has got muscles on top of muscles. He looks and how like low is that body? And how star. low is that body fat look? Too. I mean, <laughs> he, I know. I mean, he looked. I mean, he looked. His energy level was great. His output was awesome. His, his he was vascular, lean. I mean, wow, he put it. But on But don't Americana. forget who he was in there with the guy that you know. Ha- yeah, I mean, a guy who has not been at a high level, has not been active. It, neither one of them have been. the The first thing I thought about that fight was who cares. I'm gonna be honest. 
I mean, that's what you're going to get over here. Well, who cares? 100%. At, it's like at, the fight was like five years too late. Yeah, I mean, at this point in their careers, what they've done and what's been in their review mirror, uh, you know, recently uh, with all their inactivity, uh, both of them are quitting fights. And again, you don't like to hear it here. I know some of you British fans over there, you, you know, you anoint those some of the British fighters, like on Mount Olympus, uh, I get it. You love them. But come on, let's be a little, let's keep things in some kind of proper context and, and, and control <laughs> our emotions just a, you know, a tad. I think that's what they. It was talk basically over a there. personal Tad, personal Tad. grudge match. Yeah. It seemed that yeah. was the only real yeah, that selling was the, point. Was that I they agree. Des- they hated each other. That was the only part. And, and listen, I I will applaud the honesty of Brooke for saying that. Basically, he said that after the fight that now basically I could retire or I could be at peace because this was important to me. This to be able to win this fight with this particular guy they could both come obviously from across the pond and there was a rivalry there was a dislike for each other there was you know a, whatever you want to call it uh and this meant more to him obviously brook being him then some of his more recent fights meant to him like the crawford fight obviously and listen i know it's a different caliber but i know he didn't behave or come close to behaving uh the, the way he did the other night he didn't do that with Crawford uh despite the I get the difference of talent again I'm repeating myself but you could still behave uh like a guy that means everything to you and it looked like it meant everything and that's what you expect when a fighter gets into the ring that it means everything to you and that's what people are paying tickets to watch that kind of you know, attitude, that kind of uh, effort, if you will. But obviously against Crawford, it didn't mean everything to him. And obviously it did mean everything to him against uh, Khan. And again, sticking with the consistency consistency of what we, we bring and we try to bring and we want to bring is telling things that some people want to sit on the fence, some people that want to have a do- have an agenda for whatever reasons not to necessarily tell you everything that could be told to you we don't have that problem and i know a lot of people that think of khan's name as literal he he is a mere khan that he's conned his way and listen i'm not forgetting he's a silver medalist i called his fights when he fought in olympics i believe it was the 2004 my second olympics um I called those fights, uh, and he won his silver medal, and he was terrific. And if my memory serves me right, he was 17 years old, the youngest British fighter ever. That's correct. Yeah, the youngest. Yeah, he was 17. The youngest British fighter ever to to medal in the Olympics. So I give him all that. I give him all that, uh, and he. I give him. I give you a quick breakdown of what he was physically and uh, for me as a fighter. Uh, it was 2000, 2004 at the Athens yeah, Games that was when it. he won the silver. Listen, fast yep. hands, uh, good right hand, puncher, mostly straight punches. You know, his form was, you know, he was never really sloppy in any ways. Decent legs. Uh, and more and more apparent, uh, you know, not the greatest set of whiskers in the world. You know, where there was some porcelain. Uh, in that China, if you will, yeah. or in uh, in that Chin. So, I yeah, but to your point, not the best whiskers in no, the world. No, not the Much best. Much closer to the bottom than the top yeah, of that not list. The best. I mean, he was getting rocked with everything. Well, listen, not just now. Throughout his career, that was I mean, yep. you know, on his way up, uh, he had been knocked out in one round. He got caught. Those things can happen in one round fights. You get caught cold, but that was one of his first steps up uh, in competition uh, with um, Prentice Prescott. Yeah, Prescott him knocked him out. No, that was the Prescott fight. And then listen, he overcame that. He went on to win a world title. But again, we we give the full X ray here. Uh, he's the thing that he was always best at. And again, good hand speed. Uh, good legs, good right hand, straight right hand, all of that. 
and, and fought with spirit, all of it. But the thing that he was better at than even what he did inside the ring, he was always great at making money. Uh, he really was. I mean, even that's when he... That's for sure. That, yep. that's, yeah, you have to say that if you're going to be fair about this, you know, analysis of his career, uh, this overview of his career. Yeah, but that's part of, that's part of boxing. Uh, yeah, you want to like be you're successful at that. You're, yeah, you, and he was yeah, very good is at finding a way to make money at all times. Yep. And even when he came out of the Olympics, he was very popular. Again, it's a big advantage being a fighter, especially if... You can fight a little bit, but it's a big advantage over across the pond to my beautiful brothers and sisters over there. Seriously, because you don't have LeBron James. You don't have Tiger Woods. You know, you don't have all these other competitions to go up against. And when you when you are built up the right way and they know how to build them up over there to do promotion over there for the fighters, you identify with with people <coughs> with the household and you become a star and it doesn't happen like that over here i mean you have to be really mike tyson you gotta i mean you have to be you know charlo and he's from mexico canelo, canelo i'm canelo, sorry not charlo. yeah canelo you have to be huge yeah you wouldn't want charlo's numbers that they've been getting over there at <laughs> ppc and uh, over there, they haven't been getting too great numbers, quite frankly, uh, at all. And he's and, out of the in his in his extracurricular activities uh, yeah, in lucky. the last couple of weeks yeah. ain't going to help him well, sell no, any more no, fights. Uh, terrible. So, getting back to Khan, and there's a lot of people again that say, yeah, he's always been a good Khan artist because he's always been able to sell himself. And listen, you could also say kudos, uh, congrats, you know, to him being that smart on social media. Uh, look at the money that he got for that Canelo fight. Uh, and he and he did a lot of it on his own by just pushing the social media, promoting himself. He Even when people thought it was ridiculous to have that fight, and it turned out ridiculous, although he did good the first five rounds, then he gets caught you know, and put to sleep in the sixth round. Um, just like that, like putting a light switch out. But he's... He, was coming out of the Olympics, silver medal, 17 years old. And if my memory serves me, Ken, he showed the capacity to make money then and his people around him, where he lost to the Cuban, like a legendary amateur fighter, really good amateur fighter in the Olympics. And then he fights him a rematch um, when he comes out of the Olympics. I don't even know if he was pro yet, to be honest, but... He fights him in a stadium where, again, if I'm remembering correctly, they put like 40,000 people there and he fights them and he wins the fight. What did you expect that was going to happen? You don't think he was going to get that decision over in London? Uh, you know, when they built it up, the way they built it up to have this attraction with the guy that beat him in a gold medal match. But I don't remember it to say that he didn't deserve it. I'll say that he did deserve it. But that's unusual. He didn't even turn pro and he's getting that kind of fanfare, that kind of, you know, backing, uh, that kind of attention. So he always was the golden touch, the Midas kid, if you will, to make money. Uh, he got... Was that guy's name? Was the Cuban? Was Kin it Mario Kinde Kin Kin or something? Kin Kin All right. So that fight took place on the 14th of May, 2005. Just for a refresher, the Olympics were in August of 04. So they put that fight on. You know how many people viewed that fight? A lot. 6.3 million people tuned in to see an amateur fight Ex on ITV in the UK. Again, to my point. That you can build guys yep. up that you could never do that over here. Never. Never. I mean, you no. have to be basically like Godzilla, a combination of Godzilla and... Sugar uh, Ray Leonard. And, yeah. Uh, to really get to that place. Uh, and, and you have to fight really, you know, significant guys. Over there, there one of the early ones to do that was Chris Eubank, where, you know, now yep. there's a Chris Eubank Jr. I understand that, but Chris Eubank Sr., 
over here, and I like him. I, I know him very well. Um, I had a kid fight him in the amateurs over here in New York when he was like 16 years, 17 years old, whatever. Um, no, maybe a little older than that. But whatever it was, uh, in one of the smokers I used to take the kids to in the Bronx, in the South Bronx, for all those years. So I, I know who he is, who Chris Eubank Sr. is, and I'll tell you, I like him. I give him all the credit in the world. He was a showman. He knew how to do business. He he stayed undefeated for a period of time, won the title, and he made a lot of money, a lot of money. Having said that, he wouldn't have done that over here. That's it. I'm not going to go. There's no reason to go more. It's a fact. He would not. He would have been another guy. But over there in England, he was the guy. The guy. And and again, I, I could listen I to Chris Eubank Sr. I had off. I to could him. listen to Chris Eubank Sr. talk about anything. I love his accent, his attitude. Very amusing guy, very entertaining, and um very <laughs> physical, strong guy. And listen, give him all the credit in the world. And in some ways he was a little bit of a trailblazer, you know, over there, really coming out and being able to promote himself the way he did into such a multi-million dollar star uh it, it really was something and it was had a lot to do with him but it had more to do with the geography of where he was fighting where he lived uh again to yep. finish up on Khan, uh terrific career a lot of money i don't know if he's retiring now but obviously neither one of them don't get seduced but i know you're all already if you're over across the pond i get it i that's i get it that's what you guys do and i understand i do i understand um and i'd sit down and eat crumpets with you drink tea and talk about it i would because i i get it um where he's your guy and now some of you are drinking that kool-aid oh he fits into the top three or four or five no he don't don't forget the crawford fight don't forget the, some, his recent fight. No, he don't. Yeah, he, he did what he did against Khan at this point in Khan's life, at this point in Brooks' life. Uh, yeah, he was able to perform and be the much better guy. Uh, but don't fool yourself. Please, please be careful. That road, that turn coming up above, you could go right off the cliff. <laughs> be careful, guys. I love you. I care about you. But he, he's not ready. He's not ready to fit in that mix. And he might retire because he talked like he got what he wanted. But don't get fooled by that. And, uh, you know, again, this was uh, a big payday for them. Can you imagine? I mean, these are two guys that you can get as many as you want when I say that. But you could say they were two shot guys. I don't care how mad they get because I care about the truth and what I believe to be the. You could have said these are two shot guys, and they. When you heard what they probably got paid over there, you'd say, "Oh my God, they're getting paid more than top guys over here, and they're two shot guys." <laughs> and Brooke, that's part of the magic. When you could be a shot guy mentally or physically or a little bit of both, and you could fight a guy who's shot, and you look like you're not shot. <laughs> you 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 you're the less shot guy, okay? And uh, <laughs> that's a good point, really. And and also, he was the more motivated guy. You could see that uh, in obviously yeah. the way he fought that fight. The only thing I disagree with you, Ken, was, and you said it correctly that you thought it was going to be a great fight. It looked like it was starting, and then it became obviously one sided. I thought it was one sided in the first round because you know he goes. Yeah, he came out firing and all that stuff, but he drops him in the first round, uh, hurts him in oh, the yeah, first yeah. round. So for me, it was one-way traffic uh, the whole night. Uh, yeah. really was. Sometimes I think when that happens, like in my mind, I think a lot of people do this. You want so bad for it to be a competitive yeah. fight no, you do. that you're almost trying to see it competitively, and you're like, no, nah. like you said, that wasn't one-sided if you were looking at it like – from an from an analyst perspective of like no what am i seeing here i was just like oh shit these guys are going at it i called my kids in i was like hey guys yeah, it's a good well, fight here I these understand. guys hate each other and the next thing you know my son said dad this isn't a good fight one guy is beating the crap out of the other guy oh well, your son might replace 
Andrew was my my uh, <laughs> co-host here because uh, his analytical sure eye is, is obviously uh, <laughs> advanced from his pop. You mentioned that Chris. Day. You you mentioned Chris Eubank Jr. He was the first one to call out Kel Brook. He said, "Nice win, but let's see if you can fight like that against me." This is on Twitter. To which Kel Brook says, 155, otherwise don't mention my name. Eubank says, you fought Triple G at 160, so you will do the same with me if you want the biggest payday and beating of your career. If not, I've got much bigger fish to fry, and you don't. So, anyway. Again, never. Eubank, <laughs> if he was over here, um, you'd be saying, where is Eubank? Who, what's Eubank? Is that near the Netherlands? Or... <laughs> is that is that a good fishing place? Is that a place where you get really can really load yeah. up? You know, if you charter a boat, you go there. Is that a place you can really load up and make some money on bringing in fish? And again, am I not? Attica. Am I really? Am I being malicious? Or, no, I'm I'm kidding. But I'm also putting a point across. Uh, Eubank Jr. deserves credit just like his father. He followed in his footsteps. He's making money. He's having a terrific career. Uh, keep at it. Keep at it and all the all the good fortune in the world to you. But I'm pointing out that it does matter where you're born sometimes, where you fight, where you you do whatever your living is that you do. You know, there's some place you could go to school and be a doctor, and you're not making that much. But you come over here to the United States, you were, and you're a doctor here, and you were born here, and you were fortunate enough to be born here. Well, you're doing pretty, usually you're doing pretty damn good. But there's places that that's not as automatic. So, and it's the same thing in my business, in, in the fight business. So, uh, you got that... Uh, you know, again, uh, <laughs> they got a lot out of it. You talk about getting as much out of, you know, squeezing that that lemon or whatever, squeezing that orange to get every drop. They have gotten every drop out of those two British fighters. They really, they really <laughs> have, uh, as, as far as being able to make money. Well, speaking of the Brits, I know they're going to be happy with this episode. Let's keep it over in the UK. Big heavyweight fight supposed to be taking place April 23rd. Dillian White's going to finally get his crack at the title against Tyson Fury. I don't know if it's been officially finalized. I know for the past few weeks, Tyson's been talking on um, Twitter. Dillian White's been uncharacteristically quiet. And um, as of this morning, I saw Tyson Fury tweeting out saying, hey, has to, Dillian has till today to assign the official agreement to fight on the 23rd. I can't imagine that he would fumble this bag but nevertheless i'm assuming it's gonna get done but that's an interesting matchup all british affair the fight's gonna take place in the uk i'm sure you've got some thoughts on this we'll do a much more thorough analysis as we get closer but like with a lot of these big fights we don't like to invest too much time and effort into them until they are finalized but given the lack of um, activity recently in boxing we wanted to cover as much as we could today so what are you looking for in that fight and um how do you think it goes unless and anything's possible. People can be strange. Remember that song? There's a, there was a song, I guess, what was it? The Doors? Where uh, strange people, strange. Remember that song uh, by <laughs> Vaguely. Morrison? You know, they did a movie on him and everything from The Doors. Uh, and... Uh, it was people strange. Uh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's yep. it was a famous song. Robo, Robo, cue it up yeah. as we uh, yeah, as yeah. we're talking. People I'm sure he'll have strange. it dumped in there. They're like <laughs> probably Morrison's version of it, maybe a, a tad bit uh, more than mine. But unless Dan White has some kind of strange um, fetish or something, and you never know. But I'm just saying. With being a mandatory challenger, you better take this fight because he's been a mandatory yeah. challenger longer than Haley's Comet was last seen. <laughs> I mean, you talk about world records. I guarantee you, Ken, you don't even have to look it up. Rob, save yourself. Yeah. You don't have to look this one. He's been a mandatory challenger longer than any fight in the history of the sport. He has to be. He has to be. I mean, really, he has been 
<laughs> he they wrote his name in permanent marker and they couldn't get it off, so he stayed there. <laughs> He's been a mandatory longer than John Dillinger was on wanted posters. I mean, <laughs> they, so unless he has some twisted, you know, thing with liking to be, which you never know, but liking to just be the mandatory. Obviously, he's got to he's got to get that signed and agreed to before it goes away. If that is a real deadline, who knows? Half these things are on real deadlines. But if it is a real deadline, oh, for sure. he, he's, he's got to get it done. Um, what do I think of the fight? I like Fury. I mean, uh, Dan White, is he a guy that's strong? Can he punch? Yes. Is he big? Yes. Obviously, Fury's even bigger. But, um, but he's a big, strong guy? Yes. And I was one of the first guys to like Dillian White. He had beaten a guy. That's he knocked right. out a guy named Brown or something. I can't remember, but nobody knew who he was. He was coming <laughs> up. He had been knocked out by, uh, with, he got probably too soon. He got put in with, with, um, with Anthony Joshua. He got knocked out in about five rounds. But then he was coming back, and I saw him on some kind of like obsolete cable show. And I saw him fighting, um, I think his name was Brown, big, big guy and he knocked him out and i just liked him i liked him he's still a little raw but i said i like this guy he's going to develop more he he's tough he's strong goes to the body well i like him and since then you know he's obviously lucas brown lucas brown that was it thank you ken and thank you he obviously has made money um he's been a mandatory again you know longer than you know uh, I mean, what can I say? Longer than Noah was up in the hills, right? Uh, again, <laughs> just to make my point clear. And he's, one thing about him, he got knocked out by a 40-year-old uh, perfect, my former fighter. Now, yeah, he got a little reckless. That was unfortunate he, for Dillian. Yeah, he got reckless, yep. all right. But then he came back. They did what they had to do. They got... Pavekin in the ring right away, even though Pavekin was coming off COVID and most likely might not have taken a fight at 41, 42 at that point that quickly, Ken, but he had no choice. What are they going to do? They know they're at the end of their career, the end of the road, and basically you know that that Eddie Hearn and the people with uh, the people with, with D and White were basically paying him a ransom of money. We're paying them whatever it took to get in the ring because they had to redeem them. They had to get the win back from that knockout loss that derailed them. They had to get it. Matter of fact, they had to get it fast because they actually thought it would put them back in a mandatory position to fight the next fight with the with Joshua. I think it was with Joshua, uh, whichever champion it was. But they thought it would put them right back in that seat and they were a little off. Because it, it didn't. It, it, it didn't because all the fights that took place, you know, the Wilder uh, third fight, uh, you know, the, the Usyk fight, all those fights turned out to be the ones that were going to take place because of the way the politics went, because of the way that the, everything did go. Um, and now we're back to where we are. But so they, they didn't get back in with a champion. They thought they basically... We're going to take a great eraser, really, and just erase that. Like literally erase it from the minds and from the record books uh, by coming back, knocking out a 42-year-old perfection who had knocked them out, and then rectifying everything right back to where they were. Don't miss a beat. Didn't quite work that way, but they did get their mandatory back. They are back now in that position where... They are the mandatory uh, for Fury. And they, one thing that doesn't go away, I evaluate him as a strong guy, good body puncher, aggressive, tough, uh, good power. But he's also a guy who gets, and he was winning the fight handily against Perfectin. I'm going to give him this one. I'm going to say he just got reckless. Okay, I'll go with it. But he got knocked cold. I'll go with it. No problem. Got hit a uppercut beautifully timed that he never saw. And he was beating the crap out of Perfectin. Did he have him down twice? I said that. Oh, okay. But 
I've seen him in other fights prior to that where he didn't get, well, he did get knocked out by Joshua, but we would say that he wasn't ready for him. But yeah, I saw him in other fights, Ken, where he came this close to being knocked out, where at yeah. the end of the fight, somewhere at the end of the fight, he either got saved by the bell or just very fortunate that he survived. And he came, as I said, this close to being knocked out. What does that tell me? It tells me, which I said to them directly, to him and his agent when I talked to him, to be quite frank, where every... I've seen you in too many fights where at some point you get hit too clean with a punch that you don't see that really, really hurts you. That, that, that's dangerous. That's something that you don't want as an M.O., that's something that means something. I, I mean, yeah, there's been fighters get hurt, blah, 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 blah. But I'm talking about a heavyweight who too often has been hurt before the night ended, before that final bell rang. You found a way to get hurt. or found a way to allow yourself to get caught. A clean punch you shouldn't have allowed yourself to get caught. Uh, too often. So for me, that's hanging in the air above this fight. Uh, part of the reason why I'm breaking it down the way I am and I'm picking Fury. Now, having said that, he's not a walk in the park. I mean, he is a good puncher. You know, he is a game guy. He is experienced now. Um, you know, and you would think he's hungry, you know, having waiting for this title shot again, even though he had one early in his career against Joshua. Again, when he thinks he's more prime for it, uh, you, he's he is real in that way. I just feel that Tyson will be too fast on his feet if that's what he chooses to do, because you never know with Tyson Fury. He showed you that other dimension now <laughs> against Wilder, where he could also walk you down, and that's a great option that he could box like a lightweight, and then he could go and walk forward like a you know a Tyson, if you will. So. Uh, not too many heavyweights, not too many fighters can tell you that they have those alternate gears, that they have the capacity to be able to be that dimensional in a ring. So if he decides to box, it seems like he's too nifty, too cute, too fast, too mobile, um, too complete for Dillian to be able to catch up to him and and beat him at that game. It seems that way. It seems like Dillian would be plodding forward, trying to get to him and getting picked off and outmaneuvered. It seems that way. Then if it went the other way into a firefight, well, I'll tell you one thing. We've already seen Dillian White knocked out. I've never, I've never, I don't know if there's anyone today in the heavyweight division that can prove from their body of work that they have a better chin than Tyson Fury. I mean, you got hit with the hardest punch on the planet uh, <laughs> in, in, in Wilder, and you survived each time. I mean, yeah, you were hurt. Yeah, you were on the floor. But you survived each time that happened with that kind of Thor's hammer punch hitting your freaking chin, and then you knocked, and then you knocked him out twice. So I don't know anyone who's had a better tested chin uh, than Fury to say that you would think he'd survive Dillian White's punch, and he's a good puncher. So at the end of the day, the only thing that I think could be sort of a fly in the ointment of a win for Fury would be that if Fury mentally goes to a bad place, which you never know. I mean, there's a guy who at one time was suicidal. I give him all the credit in the world. I mean, I give him more than credit. I give him respect, admiration, love for showing people out there that are in difficult places in their life, dark rooms in their life, if you will that you shouldn't quit. You shouldn't give up on life. You can come back. That as long as, the only way you can't come back is if you quit on life. 
Otherwise, you always have a chance to come back. This is a guy who came back from the brink of thinking suicidal thoughts, which no human being should should ever have to think. And he comes back and has the success and the kind of life that he has now. He's a great story. He's a He is a great example for people that have suffered with mental health, with with depression, with those things. He really is. He, he's a hero for some of those people. That's how much I think of him. And he's a genius in the ring, to be honest. But he's still crazy, you know, and I say that, you know, in a in a loving sort of way, I do. You know, he's a guy who's very emotional. He's a guy who obviously can be conflicted. Uh, you know, he's, uh, and we hope he's still in a good place. It seems like he is, uh, and that mentally, emotionally. But with that background, that's the one, that's the only, as I said, the only possible fly in the ointment of an upset here, that he's not right mentally, that maybe he's, you know, he's gotten enough of a fill, if you will, of the success, the extraordinary success that he's had that he's had enough and that it doesn't mean as much and that he could get caught sleeping a little bit. I, I don't know. But my job is to put out the possibilities. And that's what I'm doing. That's If that happens, then, yeah, maybe there's a chance for an upset. But other than something along that line, something down those roads, I you have to like Fury for all the reasons I said. So um, that if, you know, if, if it ever gets made. But, you know, I, you don't know because, as I said, he's got the world record already of being a mandatory Dean. And <laughs> maybe he wants to add to that. <laughs> you know, I, maybe he wants to make sure that he's in Guinness Book of World Records for that forever. <laughs> well... That will be interesting to see what happens. I assume it's going to get made. But um, in other boxing news, I saw this week um, or last week, um, they're talking to Zone is talking to. Apparently, Canelo turned down the PBC offer to fight Charlo, and he's going to do a two-fight deal with the Zone. He's going to fight um, Bevel at light heavyweight, and part of the two-fight deal is that he's going to fight Bevel and then move on to Triple G to f- wrap up the uh, their trilogy. Um Lots to discuss there, but interesting that they passed up on the uh, PBC fight. I'm sure that the Charlos weren't happy to see that uh, payday slip away because there's not going to be another fight that pays like even half of what he could have made to fight Canelo. What do you think on uh, Canelo Bevel? All right, I give him credit. Canelo, I give him credit. 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 Because I've said when he was picking guys that looked like they were more than they really were, um, I pointed it out, you know, when he was picking, whether it was the Billy Joe Saunders, uh, whether it was Plant, um, and I like I like Plant, you know, a lot. And, it, and he's made himself out of not being an extraordinary talent in one area, but just being real good in a lot of areas and solid. He, he had a he, he won a world title. He had a, a nice little career there. He still has in front of him. Who knows what he's going to do. Um, but he was picking, he was picking guys, Charlo, uh, not Charlo, I'm sorry, Canelo, that was smart because he was much better than him. He was going to win. There was really, there was no chance. And I said it. I'm not being a Monday morning quarterback. I said it. You could back me up on that one, Ken. You know, I and I know you always back me up when, <laughs> when you think I'm right. And, you know, I I said when we were forecasting those fights that they're gonna he's gonna knock both guys out. It's not what people think it's gonna be. And then you got some of these you people described exactly what was yeah. gonna happen. And you got the One fans out there. Oh no, fights. it's gonna be that. Okay, fine, fine. I could be wrong, but in those kind of cases, I didn't feel I'd be wrong because I know something about my business in that way. Doesn't mean that I I, I still don't get them wrong. I do. But I felt that those were easy ones for me because of the reasons I pointed out. There was nothing those guys could do better than Canelo to have a chance to win. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they it would show out. It would show out in that way. And it did. 
But now, and he was smart, Canelo. He's getting paid all this money. He's picking guys with belts, guys with undefeated records. So it looks good. He's getting paid. It justifies paying him the money. It justifies people coming to watch it. You draw them in, you know, to the extent that they, whatever numbers they did. Um, so it was smart. But this one is nothing about that stuff. It's nothing about those things. You know, thinking about, hey, we got to get the guy with the right record. We got to get the guy that looks like it's going to be competitive, but we have a huge edge. And then we can sell. No, no, it's not about that. This is a guy that could beat him. This is a guy who's naturally bigger, light heavyweight. Um, I know Canelo's bigger now. He's a whole different human being now. I get it. I don't, I don't you know, I get it. He, you know, that, that, I don't know if that beef in Mexico has anything to you and me. Got to go eat down there one day, Ken. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta go down there have some lunch. Um, maybe stay for a week. You know, have a few meals and see how we look when we come back. You know what I mean? We we'll come back looking like Kel Brook. Uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> I won't, but you will. You will. <laughs> but I give Canelo credit because you still got to go in there. You know, if you're in baseball, you still got to hit that hundred mile an hour fastball that curveball you still got to do it and am i talking about barry bonds i don't know but in boxing you still got to go in there face the dangers and get it done and canelo gets it done and he gets it yep, done in different weight classes sure. and he's been getting better as a fighter and i said that that was the big difference for me between him and triple g when they were even <laughs> coming up because when they first started their fights, because Canelo continued to get better and Triple G didn't. He didn't. He was still strong and tough and bigger than a lot of guys, but he wasn't getting better. And I think his trainer at the time, Sanchez, had something to do that, stagnated it. And obviously, Triple G felt that too because he made a change in trainers to, to um, Banks, right? Johnny Banks. Um, Jonathan Banks. Yeah, Jonathan yep. Banks. So, Punk. yeah. So uh, with the, the great Emmanuel Stewart, who used to be with the great Emmanuel Stewart, as his right. one of his, as his you know protege, Emmanuel was his mentor. So and you can't get better than that. But the facts are the facts that Canelo did get better, and now he's the man. You know he's the golden goose in the sport, and he can pick whoever he wants and make that guy rich or richer. Yep. I give him yep. credit. He picked a dangerous guy. He picked a guy who had a great amateur background. He picked a guy that's been a world champion, has the confidence, the experience of being a world champion. Uh, he's picked a guy that I already said is natural bigger. He's, he's a good technical fighter. He's a solid boxer. You know, he can fight with you, but he likes to box. He's a small cerebral guy. He's good. He's, he's really good. And he picked him. He didn't have to pick him. You know, maybe he didn't pick Charlo, which would have been easier, I believe. But maybe he didn't pick Charlo because, because the reason I phrase it that way, because there's some maniacs out there. Because, listen, you're a fan. <laughs> because, no, part of being a fan is being a fanatic. That's short for fan. You know, fan is short for fanatic. <laughs> so I get it. You have the right to be a nut. And there'll be some out there that'll go on that thing called the internet, whatever those websites are, right, that I never look at, but I get told about them once in a while. Um, they still exist, right, Ken? They're still out there, right? Yep. And oh, yeah. there'll be guys who say, oh, he's afraid of Charlo. Oh, Charlo was going to whoop him. Was going to whoop him. Okay, whatever. But I maybe, I don't know if Charlo didn't want to fight maybe i don't know i don't know if they even had a choice in the matter i don't know if it was they asked for too much money i don't know any of that all i know and i'm not pretending to know i just know the possibilities and at this point i know maybe it was the weight maybe you know maybe uh, which i could see maybe where you know at this point in his life Canelo, after putting this muscle on, is not going to go back to 160. Maybe he said, hey, you got to go to 168. And maybe Charlo said no. Maybe that's a very possible. Maybe it is. If it even got that far in talking about the fight. 
But what I do know, and what we all do know, is he picked Bevel. That's going to be an interesting fight. That's going to be... I get crazy when people call Canelo, and I don't know how far back they go in their history, and I doubt it's too far. And they go and they say he's the greatest Mexican of all time. They forget about guys like Chavez and Sanchez. And, and forget about it. I I could just go on and on and on because Mexico has that kind of heritage in boxing. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. It, it's Olive, uh, what's the one I'm thinking? Olive, um, uh, one of the greatest Mexican warriors of all time. Can't think of his name. And and he, um, look it up for me. Uh, it starts with an O. And, and he, he had about 90 fights and he he might be the greatest action, and that's quite a statement because you had nothing but action fighters in the great heritage of great Mexican champions. He might have been the greatest action Mexican champion ever, really. Um, Ruben Oliveras? Yeah, that's who I was thinking, Oliveras. <laughs> I mean, you got guys like him, uh, and not to mention then that you go to the great uh, Marquez, you know, you go to the one man, well, Marquez. You go to the great, great Marquez, and, and then you go, you know, you go to um, uh, Barrera, and then you go to uh, uh, who's the other one the, from the modern era? Uh, one man, well, Marquez, yeah, yeah, yeah. Marco Antonio Barrera, yeah. Ruben Oliveira, Salvador Sanchez, well, Eric Morales. Yeah, Morales, and then you got Morales, and you got all the guys I mentioned the, from earlier you know the sanchez who died much too early uh in a car crash but you got these great and then you uh, you got chavez senior um you got mm. uh, really but so i get crazy when he's, they, my, he's my favorite well he's Caesar, a lot Caesar of people chavez. you're right you're not you're showing good 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 judgment by saying that and and then i but it does get me crazy when they go and say, oh, he's the greatest. No, you have to fight the kind of fighters that these guys fought. And it might not be possible. They might not exist anymore <laughs> at this era, at this time. Uh, they might not. But that doesn't change the fact that those guys did fight those guys. And they did beat those guys for that period of time. So you can't leapfrog yep. those guys in the history of greatest Mexican fighters. But I'll tell you one thing. And it's got nothing to do with hate. These people say, oh, he's a hater. Uh, you're a hater, you dope. <laughs> you dope. Uh, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got to do with me believing what I believe in, believing in the criterion that has to be put forward to make these decisions, to make these, you know, to come up with uh, these kind of judgments and placements in history. And... Canelo didn't doesn't belong there, but if he not there, not with that list, but not with the guys he's beaten compared to who they beat. But if he goes and is impressive in beating Bevo, uh, you know what? I start to drink the Kool Aid a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. I mean, small glass, you know, small. But I start to warm up with you guys a little bit. Um, and then if he goes and fights, better be a forget it. I'll drink a full glass. Oh, my God. I'll, I'll drink the a full glass. The thing is, for him to get to better be of with a two-fight deal with the zone, at least, thank God, he'll have the flexibility to do it. But let's just say he fights Bivol in May on on a, on a Mexican Independence Day. He fights twice a year. Then he fights uh, Triple G in the fall. I mean, by the time he gets to better be of, better be of is going to be close to 40 years old if he keeps going like this. So well, well know, it could said. be perfect timing for him to, well said. to pick off Triple G and then get better be Well BF, said. So. And some people know. could say that he's re... Some people... Offer, I'm so glad you said that. Because some people will say he is just revisiting the script that he followed when he fought Triple G the first time. That he waited till he got yeah. a little older. A little older. And then he fought him and Did he... Did the same thing with Kovalev. And, and Kovalev. But he would especially Triple G... Because everyone thought... You know, that's the fight, and, and obviously it was a much-wanted, anticipated fight to, to prove out Canelo. And listen, I, I'm consistent. I said it. I'm documented. I thought he won both fights, and I was there 
for ESPN covered both fights. So I was right there. I thought that I thought Triple G won both fights. I thought Canelo lost both fights. The first fight, uh, he, you know, I thought that uh, Triple G brought his brand of fighting. Got inside, got close. I'm not gonna say manhandled him, but he fought that kind of fight. A fight, you know, an engaged fight, and he won, and he won, and I thought he won fairly clearly. The second fight was closer. I thought that Triple G changed it up a little bit and won with his jab, believe it or not. Um, and <laughs> but he didn't get the wins. I get it. But here's where I stand on the second part of that that you know that deal for Bevo to fight package. The second one, I don't want to see it. I'm not interested. I think Triple G's gotten too old. I think he's diminished. I'm, I, I think he's been great. He's been great. He doesn't need me to go out there and lobby for how good he's been. But I think that he's diminished. I think that he's been inactive too long. Uh, I think he's not even just inactive. He's gotten old, older. And the other guy hasn't. Canelo's younger, but he hasn't gotten to where, you know, he looks a little shop-worn or he looks a little diminished. If anything, he looks better. And Triple G doesn't look better. He doesn't look better. So that fight I'm not interested in. I, I picked Triple G to win both of the fights. So anyone who wants to call me a hater against Triple G, again, the same crap. Um, hey, you should at least do your homework and see that I backed him in those two fights in Canelo and said he won, okay? What I'm saying now is because that's what I'm saying now. Because that's what now tells me that to say, for me to believe that I'm telling the truth, is that... It's a difference now. There's a gap now. Uh, maybe a great gap now that didn't exist before between Triple G and Canelo. I wouldn't be surprised if people are going to choke on this one, but if Canelo possibly <laughs> stopped him late. And, and if not, he at least wins the fight very handily. Uh, so that fight doesn't interest me. Uh, I'm not trying to take money out of the pocket of Triple G's. Made a lot of money. I don't think he has to worry in that area. Uh, but that doesn't intrigue. Better be if, before it gets, as Ken pointed out, very, very astutely, uh, before Better be if gets too old, because he's getting close to that place, um, I would I would say make, it, make that before the Triple G fight. If that's the place and the road that we're going with Canelo. Yeah, I don't think that happens just because they got the two-fight deal. And also, um, the one nice thing, though, for Triple G is if he does do the two-fight deal and he gets Bevel and then he and then he gets Triple G, he's the ultimate free agent. He can do anything. And you know that they ain't let, better be as with ESPN and uh, Top Rank. You know they're not showing any flexibility to put him in any dangerous fights. Like, it's just, I feel like the, the, the sides of the streets are further away than they've ever been in this era. Like, crossing over like the fact that there was even a possibility to get uh, Canelo and Charlo was only because Triple G uh, Canelo is the free agent and can negotiate with anyone thank God it frees him up to explore all those fights but That's I just feel true. like getting any of those cross promotions at this point like you said a million times before unless it's Pacquiao Mayweather type money it just ain't happening no one's like better be a B of all we'd better chance of hitting a lottery Ah, you can't argue. I mean, uh, history has shown it. Uh, unless, I'll throw one in there, unless you just run out of opponents. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. You, you, you run, because at that level, there has to be some level to your opponent. Has some. You got to be able to sell it on some, in some way. On, on some level, you got to be able to sell it, really. Uh, well, although they do get away with some that you shake your head. I gotta, I do have to go back on that. I mean, they put Canelo in there with that guy, Vadim. Or Vlad, uh, I mean, he fought a couple guys on that DAZN deal where you were like, I never even heard yeah. of this guy, and I think I pay attention. Uh, you do pay attention. So. You're right. I mean, look, you would think again, unless they run out of viable, semi-viable 
opponents. But again, I mean, they had Triple G in there with Steve Rolls. No offense to Steve Rolls, but I mean, at one point, Triple G was clowning him and punching him on top of his head. I mean, what? Do we, I don't put anything past them. I, I, I really don't. I think even if they run out of opponents, they'll just keep bringing them in. Can that guy stand up for 12 rounds? Get him in there. Honestly, I don't oh, think... Oh, wait, I do add one thing to, to that. Guys into- go, go, yeah. go back on that. Say that again. Ask that, ask that <laughs> question. Can that, can that guy stand up for 12 rounds? And I want your same response. No. Go ahead. Get him in there. <laughs> Get him in there. <laughs> uh, well, we basically squeezed everything out of it. We squeezed every drop of juice out of what boxing gave us this week, which isn't very much. I know the fans, sometimes they send me messages like, hey, you guys keep talking about UFC. What about boxing? We love talking about boxing, but what are we going to talk about? We just got, we're, at this point, we're like about to make topics up. UFC is going to put on another show next week. They had a show last night that we're not going to talk about. They have a show next week. It's just a constant parade of competitive fights, whether you're into them or not. And boxing makes it very, is making it as difficult as they can. I mean, the boxing, Sports Illustrated Boxer of the Year is Jake Paul. I mean, what, what are we doing? Like, let's get something to talk about. We'll talk about it. Um. Anyway, bottom line is that's a wrap for this week. There's Teddy, only so much talking that we can do about <laughs> Ken's injuries, about his great, <laughs> great ability to run a marathon, and about his barber. There's only so much. <laughs> yep. And if anyone wants to come to the Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner annually uh, in November on Staten Island, you can come there and talk to us in person. You can ask every question you want to ask. When we come up on it next year in November, we'll be advertising again, and we'd love to meet you all there in person. Check out Teddy on Cameo and check out his Audible book, audio book on audible.com. And before we go, one thing that has helped me massively get through this, I can't forget to mention our friends at Athletic Greens. Again, taking it every day. You can see my bruise 14 days, 13 days out of surgery, and I'm almost back to, oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't want to jump the gun. I can almost move my shoulder up and down, but no, no all joking aslide, go to athleticgreens.com. Slash and yes, Atlas. your hair does get, get darker. Ten, Good, I'm sorry. I- <laughs> get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Those things are invaluable. Athleticgreens.com slash Atlas. Go check them out. Support our sponsors. They've been with us from the beginning. We love these guys. And honestly, it's a great product. Help us help you. And get a friend to subscribe. Because if you do want us Please. to stay around, um, I'm just being honest. Uh, That's that, right. That, it's great it's 231,000 thank you we love you we there. love you but uh it does have to move up uh continue to move forward uh on that you know on, on that that barometer whatever it's called that meter uh has to continue <laughs> to move the needle forward uh i want to get to a million i'm sorry if that sounds yes. whatever but I want to get to a million if we're going to keep doing this with you guys and it's a privilege to do it with you guys and you guys are the ones that make it possible to do it. Um, pass pass it on. You know, when, when you send out that uh, birthday card, that Christmas card, <laughs> you know, and, and, you, and you put in all those nice words you put in, put P.S. Subscribe to the fight. <laughs> Uh, no, nah, I'll do you one better. Tell them in the Christmas card or birthday card that you're giving them a free subscription to uh, the fight with Teddy Alice. All they have to do is go to YouTube and click. Do I have to log in? Nope, just click it. It's special access for you. They know your I- your IP address. Uh, we've got some big things in the works, including some T-shirts will be available very shortly. We're hopefully going to do a live event coming up soon, and we're always going to be there in November at the Dr. Atlas Foundation dinner. So, and we've gotten a lot of requests. Lookout. We've gotten a lot of requests for the yep. shirt that Ken wears so beautifully. I mean, he I mean, look at that. It, we've gotten a lot of requests for that shirt. 36 minutes to make life fair. So um that's it. They'll be coming. They'll be coming your way. Yep. So everyone have a great week guys. Get out there, get after it. Make a difference in the world. We'll see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>